Today, I want to tackle the topic and teach you how to make a sweet mead at home. Let's get started. Now, if you clicked on this video, you are interested in making a sweet mead. If you've never made mead before, you might have the inclination to think, well, it's honey-based, so it's always gonna be sweet, and that's not true. There are a lot of times where a mead is actually dry, or not sweet. So there are multiple ways to achieve a sweet mead. There are also multiple ways to do it in a dangerous fashion. So part of today is teaching you how to do it properly and warning you how to avoid, or what to do to avoid the explosive side of making a sweet mead, which does happen. So let's break this down into two main categories. Let's talk about low alcohol content, sweet meads, and high alcohol content. There is a difference between the two, and the biggest difference is your yeast. Oftentimes, yeast have a alcohol cap that is above that lower alcohol uh, by volume mead. For example, if you want to make a 7% by alcohol volume. Uh, mead that is sweet, you need to do a couple different things to achieve that properly and safely. If you're doing a higher alcohol content sweet mead, you're also going to need to do some different steps. There are some parallels, but some important things you can do either direction. The lowest ABV capped yeast I've ever seen has been probably like a 9% and that was the Safel US05, notably a beer yeast. And really, it says 9 to 11% ABV, which means that as it's consuming sugar, more than likely, if you, if you have something that can go up to 11% ABV, based off your sugars, you're gonna get that. There are no low alcohol yeasts that you're going to be able to make a 6%, a 5% mead that is sweet without doing some extra steps. So let's jump into the first of our two categories. We have low alcohol content sweet meads. So there are three ways to achieve this. Two of them I highly recommend. One of them I would uh, say there's a big cautionary thing and I don't really recommend it, but I've seen people try it with somewhat, uh, some success. And the last one is a do not do it all. So let's say you've started your mead recipe. You are, uh, you threw together a pound of honey with a gallon of water and maybe some blueberries or whatever you did. Before I go too far, I wanna mention that the most useful tool to actually achieve a sweet mead is called a hydrometer. It helps you to read the specific gravity of your brew, which also tells you how alcoholic that brew is post-fermentation. Very important, it tells you how much sugar is left. I'm gonna put some links down to it below. We'll talk about how to use it in this process, but this will save you a lot of heart heartache and uh, possibly some um, cleaning of a mess. So option one would be to take your mead you've started. Let's say you have a, a pound of honey, uh, a couple pounds of blueberries, your water up to a gallon, and you know whatever yeast you're using. That's gonna sit you at, let's say, a starting gravity of 1.050. The way I find my starting gravity, I'm not gonna to go too deep with this, is to use my hydrometer, float it in the original mixing, and record that number. Let's say that we're setting at 1.050 for our starting gravity. Our yeast is more than likely gonna be able to chew every bit of that sugar, leading, after some formulas and stuff, us to a 6.5% ABV brew. This is important to note. We know that it's gonna be that percent because your yeast will eat all of the consumable sugars in this mead. So 1.050 starting gravity all the way down to 1.000. You'll probably see that happen unless you have some really big problem with your yeast where they don't ferment all of that. Um, you've got a bigger problem if your yeast are not consuming all that sugar. So you've made your mead, it fermented from that starting gravity to the final gravity where it's at right now, or current gravity. We're now going to stabilize this brew using potassium sorbate and potassium metabisulfite in conjunction to halt further fermentation. Or if you don't wanna use those, you're going to pasteurize it. 
Pasteurizing is the process of taking your liquid and heating it up to a certain temperature for a certain amount of time, and this will kill off the yeast and basically make it to where they are not able to continue to ferment, just like our stabilizers are. Either way, for this first method, you need to stabilize it, potassium sorbate, potassium metabisulfite, or pasteurize it. When you do that, it literally halts fermentation, and at that point, you can back sweeten with whatever sugar you want. It can be fermentable, it can be non-fermentable, it can be anything, because we are safely able to do this without fear of re-fermentation. If you do not stabilize or pasteurize, what you'll find is the yeast that are in that brew, even if you've racked off them really well, are probably going to come back to life and ferment on the new sugar that you put in there. So this is important. Process one, step one, ferment all, all of your brew, stabilize or pasteurize, and then back sweeten. That's option one for your low alcohol sweet meat. You can do that at any alcohol content, basically. And we'll talk about that again later. Option two is to do the same thing, ferment through all the sugars that your yeast can right there. So you're starting gravity to a 1.000 and you can back sweeten with a non-fermentable sugar. There are tons of non-fermentable sugar options. Sometimes people don't like these because they don't always have the best taste in my opinion, but what they do is they add sweetness without allowing a fermentable sugar to be added there. So your yeast are not going to ferment on a non-fermentable sugar. Therefore, you have sweetness without having to stabilize or pasteurize. So that's option two. Option three is my cautionary one. I've seen people do this and I don't recommend it because it gets real sketchy if you're not careful. This process includes letting your, your brew ferment until you get to the sweetness level that you desire. So let's say it started at 1.050 and it made its way down to 1.010. So still some sugar, you're gonna have an active fermentation in this moment. Some people will take and they'll put, or they'll go ahead and bottle that brew, even though it might be cloudy and uh, active, and they will pasteurize it, meaning that in that bottle, they will go ahead and, and do the pasteurization process. Sometimes you do it in a sous vide, sometimes you do it in a uh, big pot. Whatever they're doing, they are taking a bottle of it and halting the fermentation, killing off the yeast that are actively in there. You can do this because that pasteurization process will kill off that yeast. However, you're gonna be left with a pretty cloudy mead. You also might, you're gonna have a dead yeast in there that's gonna affect the flavor of it. It's just not the best option in my opinion. It's also, I've seen some um, people break glass bottles or just have problems with this. So I know some people are gonna type and say, this is what I do. I would caution you that I would not do that, but that's not to say you can't. I just, just be so careful. It's, it's not worth the, the possibility of something going wrong. The fourth one that I, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, do not do this, because this is how you literally create a bottle bomb that will explode in your refrigerator, in your cabinet, and somewhere. Lots of people, and one very large company that produces a lot of low quality wines and, and meads and such, um, that's commercial, says to cold crash your brew when you get to your sweetness level that you desire. So similar to step three, you're fermenting, you get to the sweetness level that you want, and they say to take your big jug you have or whatever you have in there and put it in the fridge. And what they're promoting there is that the yeast are going to halt fermentation because it's too cold. Therefore, they will just go down to the bottom, lie dormant, and it is safe at that point to go ahead and put into bottles or whatever. And there are elements of that that are true. The yeast lie dormant. What happens is they, generally speaking, will fall out of suspension to the bottom of that container. And if you, you can go ahead and try to rack off of those dead yeast, not yeast, but dormant yeast um, into a new container. However, it's likely that you're, gonna, you're gonna get some yeast from that original brew into the next one. So the moment that you pull it into a temperature range that it can ferment again, 
it will start fermenting again and kickstart all that stuff. So if you've bottled your brew and there are yeast in there with sugar they can, they can consume, what you're gonna find is they will re-ferment and more than likely create a large buildup of CO2 in a bottle and explode over time. I've seen people try to rack off of the, the yeast multiple times and very rarely have I seen success stories. Um, I actually, here's a, a bunch of photos I found of people that have blown up bottles in their fridge with the yeast still fermenting in the fridge. I had this experience. I, I used the quote, reputable companies pro uh, product. I followed their steps, put the bottle in the fridge and it continued to ferment in the bottle, even at a cold temperature. Had I left that thing for too long, it would have exploded in my fridge and it would have definitely exploded outside of my fridge where it re-fermented, well, where the other bottle, I should say, re-fermented even more. Cold crashing is a great tool to, mm, to make your yeast lie dormant momentarily. It is not a method to stabilize or pasteurize. Use this with caution. Cold crashing is not for making a sweet mead. Please do not do it. So that's the low alcohol side. That kind of ranges between, I'm gonna say, you know, if you're making a 5% up to like 10 or 11, probably in that range. We have the other side of the world, which is a high alcohol content mead. And I'm gonna go ahead and categorize high alcohol content as anything that's like 12% or above. I'm just gonna keep that range for now. We have a lot of the same processes. Option one, just like our first one, is to ferment all of the available sugar that is there. So we've started with more sugar in the beginning to get us to a higher alcohol brew. So let's say I started instead of 1.050, I started at 1.110, which would be roughly about a 14% mead if everything fermented all the sugar. In this circumstance, my yeast will have consumed all of that sugar that they can there. So 1.110 to 1.000, giving us a 14 point something percent brew. We are then going to stabilize it with our potassium sorbate and metabisulfite or pasteurize it by heating that liquid up. Either way, you're halting that fermentation and then allowing for you to safely back sweeten with whatever you wanna use, whatever kind of sugar you want. This is a great process. I do it all the time. It's very safe. And I have, um, unless you have your, your potassium sorbate or metabisulfite is very old, um, you're gonna see that fermentation halt completely and you'll have a safe brew without explosions. The second option with the high alcohol sweet mead is to do a similar thing, but you're gonna let it ferment out and then you're gonna back sweeten with the non-fermentable sugar. Like we mentioned before, all of those options here, again, those are non-fermentable non -fermentable by the yeast. Therefore, the yeast cannot eat them and you have a sweet mead without using a stabilizer or pasteurization. This is where we have a third option that is a little bit different, that's also very helpful and that is you can always find the information about your yeast to figure out what their um, alcohol cap is. Now I'm putting air quotes around this because every yeast has, generally speaking, has an alcohol by volume cap. If you look it up, it might say 14%, and that's generally where they're gonna stop fermenting. However, healthy fermentations can go as far as they want. So for example, that 14% by volume yeast might make it to 15, might make it to 16 if it's fermenting in a healthy manner. And that's okay. That just means that it's been healthy. That's a good fermentation. You can't trust the specific ABV cap there as a biblical fact that this is where it's gonna stop, therefore I can trust this next little step. So just know that this option three is a little bit harder. For this third option, you're gonna try and add more sugar to the brew in the beginning than your yeast can handle. So if your yeast says 14%, you are gonna want to do a little bit of math to figure out, well, I wanna try and get my um, starting gravity to where I am 
getting up to, let's say, a 17% brew. So a 14% brew, like we said a moment ago, is about 1.100, 1 1.110 uh, starting gravity. For a 17% brew, we're gonna be somewhere in the ballpark of 1.130 starting gravity. So you're adding more sugar than those yeast can handle. And the hope is that post fermentation, your yeast have hit their cap, leaving residual sweetness for you to have in the brew. You do have to have the knowledge of what's going on with your yeast, what can they handle, and those things. But this generally works really well. Some of the problems that come with this are your yeast can be stressed out if they are in a very high gravity situation without proper nutrients for their fermentation or a temperature range or anything like that. They can sometimes put off, off flavors that come from stress. And when yeast gets stressed, you'll notice some um, maybe funky smells, funky tastes, things like that, that eventually will uh, dissipate from the brew, but they take time. So again, that third option, start with more sugar than your yeast can handle. A little slash of this is you can step feed your brew, meaning you start with a smaller amount of sugar. As it's fermenting, you add a little bit more, you add a little bit more until you find your yeast cap. What you'll find here though is with most yeast being 12% uh, ABV or higher, you're not gonna have a um, low ABV option here, which is why I don't include this in the low ABV side because there's not a yeast that caps out at a super low volume. This is really only useful for things that are 12, 13, 14, 15. You know, if you have a yeast that's an 18%, you're gonna really use a lot of sugar to cap that thing out and have residual sugar and sweetness without pasteurizing or stabilizing. The same low ABV method, the cautionary one I gave you of fermenting until your desired sweetness and then pasteurizing is possible. You can do that with a high ABV brew, but again, I, I don't trust this method because I've seen more damage done than good. And again, I know people are gonna type and say, this is what I do all the time, and I'm very glad it works for you. I'm choosing not to do that because I've seen the horror stories that come with that. And finally, don't trust cold crashing. You can't halt the fermentation at a high alcohol volume with cold crashing either. Don't do it. Be safe. So we covered low alcohol by volume sweet meads in this first half and high alcohol by volume sweet meads. Both are really fun to make and really good. Mead is most of the time sold sweet. You'll find some dry stuff on the market, but most of it is sweet. And I just want you to be safe I don't want to hear any, um, I know I'm gonna hear some horror stories that come from people, and I actually encourage this. If you have a horror story from maybe doing something with cold crashing or a, a method here that you said, I tried this and he, you know, just like he said, here's what happened, go ahead and put it down below because I do know that we're gonna have a little bit of a back and forth from people who trust some of these cold crashing methods with success. And again, if you've had success with it, that's great. It's just, it's a flip in a coin sometimes. And I don't want you to make a bad brew or have to replace your refrigerator because something exploded in it. Thanks for watching. I have lots of other content available, including if you wanted to make a uh, carbonated mead that is sweet. I have a whole bottle carbonation uh, back sweetening sweet mead side that I'll put that link to the video there. And then of course, if there's just other mead content you wanna find, it's probably on my channel. So thank you for watching. I hope to see you in the future with another video. Have a great day. Cheers.